So thank you very much, uh, Raj. And of course, uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk to you here today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is loophole-free interferometric test of macrorealism using heralded single photons. And I believe that this is going to be a significant shift from some of the talks we have heard before, which have been very focused on some of the technological ideas. But then, of course, today's science is tomorrow's technology. And this, this will lead to a lot of uh, very interesting technology in years to come. And um, of course, I have a lot of connections with Canada. I am uh, an affiliate here, as well as at IQC. And I'm a Simon Semino as a fellow at the Perimeter Institute as well. OK, and so I head what is called the Quantum Information and Computing Lab, which is at RRI, Raman Research Institute in Bangalore, India. And uh, we work on a large array of stuff. And you can find more details on our website. I don't know if my mouse is, yeah, you can kind of see that. And um, OK, that's interesting. So you can go to the website quite easily, looks like. OK, so uh, the areas of research are, uh, well, photonic quantum information processing, quantum computing, secure quantum communications, fundamental tests of principles of quantum mechanics and quantum optics. And so today I'm going to focus on the fourth one, uh, as this uh, experiment is more related to that. And these are, of course, the people who enable things to happen um, in the lab. So starting with some fundamental quantum questions, OK, so what do the non-classical features of quantum mechanics reveal about the nature of physical reality? So a question perhaps we've not asked uh, in this conference so far, but then a question worth pondering about. So now, you know, this everyday experience that we have of what we may call the macrophysical world, or the world that you and I belong to, how does it reconcile with the quote unquote weird behavior of quantum mechanics? Many things about quantum mechanics are not quite how they seem when we talk about ourselves and so on. And so to what extent is it possible to test quantum mechanics in the macro uh, limit? This brings us to the underlying uh, uh, you know, feature that we have tested in our experiment, which is called realism. Uh, the classical realist worldview states that a system is in a definite state for which all its observable properties have definite values independent of measurement. The fact that Raj is here and looking at his phone is perhaps going to still remain true when I look at my screen, you know, and he's probably going to still be interested in his phone. And so the fact that he's looking at his phone is not quite related to whether I'm looking at him. Uh, and so this is something that we are used to, that, you know, things happen the way they do, in whether or not I look at you. And so this is the measurement that I'm talking about. So without that also things continue. However, unlike a classical state, the specification of a quantum state does not in general give the values of the dynamical variables possessed by a system. Thus in general, the dynamical variable is taken to have no definite measurement independent value. What does that mean? In other words, a measurement according to quantum mechanics in general does not reveal a pre-existent value of a dynamical variable. So once you measure, then it reveals itself, whatever that is. But before that, you don't know what the outcome of a measurement will be. And so this bothered, for instance, Albert Einstein. He says that, you know, he likes to think that the moon is there, even if he's not looking at it, and which is perhaps how we would all like the moon to be. But then that's not how it happens in the quantum scenario. So this is the basic idea of realism. Which brings us to John Bell, who, of course, we have talked about many times in other avatars you know, during this conference, and this very nice paper on Bertelmann's socks and the nature of reality. So what does he say here? He says that, you know, the philosopher in the street who has not suffered a course in quantum mechanics is quite unimpressed by these EPR correlations, right? And so he takes the example of Bertelmann, who is his good friend and colleague and collaborator as well, whose socks, you know, are always of different colors. And so which color he will have on a given foot on a given day is quite unpredictable. And so uh, this is uh, his picture from his paper. You know, if the first sock is pink, the other is not pink. And so isn't that what we all talk about in these EPR correlations? So what is so great about these correlations? This is just not the same. So this was a question that John Bell asked. And of course, this is uh, Reinhold Badlman with his uh, socks, OK? And so, uh, the best known set of experiments which have actually uh, you know, tried to examine this question of realism are, of course, these EPR uh, Bell experiments. Uh, and, and we know all this very well. So we have a source. We have, a, I mean, for me, it's a pair of photons, but it could be anything. And so they are going to these different measurement stations. And then measurements are happening simultaneously. And some correlations are coming through. 
Okay, and so of course, if you believe and if you use uh, objective local theories, which is for instance, local realism, then you will end up with this inequality, which is called the uh, Bell inequality, um, right? And so this is something you're aware of. So when, uh, you know, Bertelmann derived Bell's inequality, he was very impressed by it, uh, because, you know, and he was also very impressed that, you know, John Bell could do this. Uh, and, and uh, you know, but of course, for a theorist, the job was always done, right? Which brings us to these experiments about these inequalities. And I don't want you to go through the whole thing here, but the underlying feature is that when Clauser wanted to do these experiments and he approached Richard Feynman, Richard Feynman actually said that, you know, um, when you have found an error in quantum theory's experimental predictions, come back then and we can discuss your problem with it. So in fact, the th it still remains the same, right? When we talk about doing experiments in foundations of quantum mechanics or fundamental aspects, we are always asked, what is the use, right? So uh, how do you write a grant application for, you know, doing these foundational tests? So we have to write in bold, you know, these are the technological things that we would affect in years to come. And so this remains pretty much the same. Uh, however, this was the kind of opposition that was faced. And then later on, you know, he, however, stuck to it and did the experiment and the rest is history. And then, of course, we have Alan Aspe and his group who went on to do, you know, more modern versions and so on and so forth. Because these experiments happened, today we have quantum communication and quantum information. Otherwise, of course, we would be still doing theory for them. And this was celebrated, uh, you know, in Caltech uh, by, and this is a very nice blog by John Preskill, where he says that, you know, many things happened in 1964, but all of them could have perhaps happened, even if the people who did them did not do them, but except this Bell inequality, which perhaps could not have been proposed by anyone other than John Bell. And it forms the basis for everything that the conference has discussed so far, right? And so this is why uh, it is interesting. Uh, going on to now Tony Leggett, who of course asks this question, and it's a very, very interesting question. Does nature differentiate between micro and macro? Of course, you know, this is a bit, bit odd because, you know, quantum mechanics is a totalitarian theory. So why should something specifically apply to microsystems and not apply to macro systems? There must be something we can do to reconcile these things. And of course, the Schrodinger cat is a very famous example of such reconciliation. So this brings us to two key notions of our everyday macroscopic world. The first set we have all been discussing and we know a lot about, which is local realism, where we have the local realist inequalities, where we need a bipartite or a multipartite system to test these inequalities, right? And then we have this concept of macro realism, which brings us to macro realist inequalities. How, so how do you test the quantumness of a system which is single? So, you know, I mean, of course, if you have two parties which are entangled and so on, you do these Bell violations. But then if you have a single system, then you can define a superposition. And a superposition of macroscopically distinct states is required. And then you can actually do what are called the legged garg inequality uh, uh, violations and, and uh, you know, variants thereof. So these are the two different notions. I, I don't know why my mouse is not working, but then it keeps you awake if I start pointing like that at the screen. So you have realism and locality, and that gives rise to the, the Bell violation experiments. And then you have realism and non-invasive measurability, which I'll tell you a little bit about, which gives rise to macro realism. So legged garg inequality is a temporal analog of Bell's inequality. So Bell's inequality requires non-locality. So legged garg is a temporal analog where you, where you sort of measure time co separated correlation functions for a system which is evolving in time with different uh, superpositions possible. And so realism is there, but other than that, we also have non-invasive measurability, which means that in principle, it is possible to determine which one of the states the system is in without affecting the state itself or the system's subsequent dynamics. And that's very difficult to do experiment, <clears throat> so which is, which is the hard part. And so original motivation was to test for these macro systems, you know, keep on increasing the size of a system and test uh, up to which uh, point you can go on violating these. And there's a series of work that has been done on this. But now, over the last few years, there is a lot of focus on using legged garg to test the non-classicality of single systems like photons, nuclear spins, electrons, and, and so on and so forth without involving the notion of locality. Which brings us to our experiment, which is a loophole-free interferometric test of macrorealism using heralded single photons. So what are the key features? The first is that it is a loophole-free experiment where both the LGI and the WLGI inequalities have been decisively violated. It's a comprehensive reputation of the um, classical realist worldview, of course, and we have uh, painstakingly assumed and, and verified that our experiment is non-invasive. 
Uh, and then the other thing we have done is that not only have we violated LGI and so on, we have actually had a perfect match with quantum mechanics here. And that is important because we have done this by taking into account all the non-idealities that affect the experiment and found the new quantum mechanical predictions and it matches very well with our experiment. And then, of course, we have a proof of non-classicality of single photon states, uh, which can be used for various applications in information theory, in communications, and what have you, right? And so, why is it important? Well, it's a short talk, so I should tell you why it is important halfway through. Uh, we have had these three different loophole-free Bell tests, which happened in 2015 from three different groups in three parts of the world. And that was several decades after the first uh, Bell test, right? And so why were they important? Because of course, you know, this is very nicely written in this article in Physics Today. You should read this if you have time. Of course, it is important to, you know, do something in an unambiguous way. Who wouldn't want to do that? But then if you do that in an unambiguous way, now you have proven that your system is ready for the applications that you want to give it, you know, whether it's in a, you know, QKD, perfectly secure QKD, or source of truly random numbers. So these are all applications now, that now are becoming very important and interesting for the Bell violation. And so, uh, and now we have a, you know, architecture where you can't have an alternative explanation for whatever it is that you're trying to do. So loophole free is important because you don't want any ambiguity in things that you are proving or disproving so that it can be used as the basis for whatever it is that you want to apply it to. And so uh, that is why we are very happy that ours is the first loophole free experiment and it is August 2022 and we still don't have a second one this year, at least there's no claim. So I'm hoping we'll pass by this year without having the two more claims that the Bell people had in 2015, okay. So we have done both LGI and WLGI. Now this is more for the people who already know stuff here in this genre because we have around eight minutes more. So please believe me that we have done loophole free uh, violation of these uh, you know, inequalities. These are the inequalities, I don't have a pointer. So the, the, the first one consists of you know, these joint measurements in times T1, T2, T2, T3, and T1, T3. And so, of course, as I said, it's two time correlation functions. It's less than equal to one for LGI. The quantum mechanical bound is 1.5. WLGI likewise. We did both, why? Because both of them are necessary but not, not sufficient conditions for uh, macro realism. So we did both so that it's stronger. And secondly, as experimentalists, WLGI has less parameters to measure. So it's less number of joint probabilities, so less error. So who doesn't like that? So that was the idea behind doing both. And this was our proposal. We have concatenated Mark Zender interferometers. A single photon is going through the first one. It can be in the upper path or the lower path. These are the two macroscopically distinct states. Similarly, the second interferometer and likewise after the second beam splitter. And now the macroscopicity parameter for our experiment is 1.2 times 10 to the 4. And that is a very large number. So now somebody would ask, how come a single photon is macroscopic? So I answer that here. So it's not about the size of the photon, of course. It's about the difference between, you know, the distance between the two arms of the interferometer and the wavelength of the photon. That is how we have defined our macroscopicity, which is context dependent. So there are several experiments which have been done in different contexts and their own definitions of macroscopicity. So this is ours. But what is important is the thing below where we have tell, told you that we have actually closed all these known loopholes that existed uh, for these uh, several, you know, different experiments in this genre. Important one is the clumsiness loophole, which is also very interestingly named. Uh, so we have done what is called the negative result measurement. What is a negative result measurement? The theorist can do this very easily. A measurement in which the outcome is inferred when the detector is not triggered, which means that, you know, I put a detector somewhere and whatever is being detected, I don't count that in the experiment. I only count the sub ensemble, which is not getting detected. So naturally, it's not very invasive because you're not even putting any detector there. And so this is a standard way of doing uh, NIM. However, even here, we can have some, something inherently invasive. So non-idealness here can result in loopholes. This is called the clumsiness loophole, the act of being clumsy and causing some invasiveness, okay? And so this is NRM. So what we have done here, which hasn't been done before, is we have used what are called the no signaling in time conditions and satisfied these no signaling in time conditions at each experimental run you know, for all three times, so both T1, T2, T2, T3, and T1, T3, we've satisfied the two time NSITs, which are actually statistical equivalents of NIM, and shown that, yes, with this satisfaction, our violation is now even more NIM than 
uh, one could have claimed with just NRM. So this is one of the USPs of this experiment, uh, a very strong closure of the clumsiness loophole. The other one is the detection efficiency loophole, which I think all of you are aware of, because it's a very common one. The assumption that all detections are 100% efficient, which is of course never the case. And so you do the um, you know, hidden variable model and find the critical detection efficiency for which your violation can be considered loophole free. And this is what we found. However, we did not want to buy detectors which were, you know, having this sort of efficiency because this, this is quite difficult in a coincidence measurement to get 85%. So we modified our measurement strategy. And so two things, two key take home messages about the, how we close this loophole. One of them is uh, instead of using a detector in the middle, we used a metal block. And so a metal block which is perfectly blocking everything is a 100% detector. And of course, we are doing NRM, which means that we don't care about what it is blocking. We only care about the ensemble it's not blocking. And so by using a 100% detector or a simple metal block, we were able to, you know, uh, come closer to, you know, closing this loophole. But the other thing we did, which is a lot of math actually, is we pushed all detections to the third, you know, the T3. And, and now this is something I can't say much here because it's a very long piece of calculation. But if you go through the paper, you'll realize that by doing that, we have been able to bring down the detection efficiency eta as just a parameter in the denominator. So anything which is non-zero is now enough. And so detection efficiency loophole thus becomes irrelevant in this context. And this, I think, is a trick. Uh, you know, which can be used by several other experiments to actually circumvent the detection efficiency loophole. Other than that, we have also closed the multi-photon emission loophole, which is important to have a bound on how much contribution is coming from more than single photons. Again, a series of experiments. So many sub-experiments have happened in this towards the final result that we have claimed. And this is the actual schematic with the displaced Saniac interferometer for the added phase stability. So clumsiness loophole has been closed by many experiments before, but the other loopholes have not gained much attention. And so ours is the first experiment which has claimed to close all the known loopholes. Nothing can be loophole free. Somebody will come up with a sixth loophole, but at least so far uh, we have closed the known ones. And so this is of course the uh, PS2 resistance, which is the which is the result slide. So here you have the experimentally measured value. As you can see, it matches beautifully with the quantum mechanical prediction. It's not just the quantum mechanical prediction, which also has been actually painstakingly worked on by my student uh, to actually take into account all the non-idealities of our experiment and have a realistic bound from quantum mechanics itself. It just cannot remain 1.5 if your detector is never 50-50. So all these things have been taken into account and that is how we have the, you know, this is so it's eight times and five times respectively the violation. And so this is us with Tony Leggett when he visited us in 2019 for his 80th birthday celebration. And the discussions, of course, enriched very much our experiment. And we're also very happy that it was noted by, uh, you know, different fora, including new scientists, which actually quoted experts as calling it the most watertight experiment in this genre uh, till date. And so that is very good after spending uh, four years on a certain experiment. So the last minute, I want to tell you that this is not all we do. Uh, of course, I wanted to tell you about this in a short talk. But then other than that, we have a lot of interest in the technology that, you know, seems to have underlined this conference so far. So we, are, we have different projects in quantum communications. We are working on India's first project on satellite-based quantum communications. We have done several ground-based milestones, including this one, which is the first, you know, free space demonstration between buildings that was achieved a couple of years ago. And now we are going on to, you know, increasing the complexity of the problem, hopefully ending with a satellite-based demonstration in the near future. We are working on quantum relays and repeaters, uh, integrated photonics as well, but not ourselves. We are collaborating with Italy. We have the protocol. The Italians are giving us the chip. And then we are working on device-independent random number generation, teleportation, and so on. And uh, higher dimensional quantum information uh, and computing, which may perhaps be the topic of some other talk. And an effective interplay, I would say, between Fundamental science and novel technologies is what I would like you to take home as a message. So this is us. Uh, we celebrated our 10 years in March this year. Now we are in our 11th year. And if you have found any interest in what we do, and if you are a student, uh, do consider applying for positions in our lab. You have to first of all like what we do and also like India. This is a combination uh, which, uh, which will work for you. So with that, I'm on time. Yeah, thanks.